Hello, everybody, and welcome to welcome, another welcome. episode of Hammering It Out. The last of the year. Hello. <laughs> you guys may notice that I am, in fact, sitting outside. This is not a green screen. Um, no. And I'm going to take a moment and mute the Twitch stream because I can hear myself talking. It's super distracting. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, probably if we're lucky, we'll see more alpacas wander by in Nath's background. Um, now, don't be worried. Nath is joined in person by fire, but not only in person, virtually we have another fire, um, secret fire. You want to say hi <laughs> Hello. to everyone? Hello to everyone. Now, yeah, Andrew, it's... why is secret fire here? Uh, I thought you knew. Oh, <laughs> wait. <laughs> Secret Fire, I, I, isn't he that guy did. who did, like, a bunch of lighting stuff? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, no, we, we have an exciting announcement, which is uh, we've been collaborating with Ludovic for a little while, who, you know, helped contribute to the amazing lighting effects that we were able to accomplish in D9, and so uh, we're continuing that collaboration forward in a more official basis, and uh, Secret Fire will be joining the team on a, a sort of part-time basis, but still joining the team officially uh, to continue um, helping us to make Foundry visually uh, as impressive as possible going forward. We have lots of exciting goals, things that we want to do with lighting and vision and weather and shaders and all kinds of stuff. And so uh, having um, having Secret Fire join us as a, an official team member is something that I'm really excited about. And he will be uh, one of us basically now, but starting early next year. Uh, and so um, we're really happy to have him get to join us and uh, celebrate his addition uh, to the team. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, you. welcome. Yeah, welcome. Welcome to the team. Thank, thank you. It, uh, I'm very proud to join the, the Foundry team. And uh, it began with token magic for fun. And for my players, then I constructed a module uh, to share this experience with the community. Uh, it was also for me a way to discover JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript was improved considerably since the 90s. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, um, it's a, it's a very uh, it's a, um, a, a, a big adventure. Yeah, and uh, very proud to to join a team with an exemplary state of mind. Thank you for for your warm welcome. Yeah, it's really exciting and. Um... I think there's been a lot of like mutual learning that we've seen since uh, you know you've been working with us because we've got I think on the team already we've got a lot of good expertise in working with modern JavaScript and that's been fun for you to pick up some of those tools and you have a lot of expertise in working with graphical shaders that are things that uh, you know I've been really excited to learn more and, and build my strengths in that area and so I think having having that kind of exchange of, of expertise and, and allowing us to work together, it's going to produce some really, really great stuff. And uh, I am super excited for what V9 already has. It's been so fun to use, and I hope the folks out there who are already using it um, are really loving how beautiful it, it makes uh, the lighting system. And uh, I just I can't wait to see where we go from here with, um, with, with more stuff. Oh, it's the same. I can't wait. <laughs> Now, Secret Fire has helped us in the past with some research and development, um, things that have gone into V9 based on some of what he researched. Nath is showing that he does, in fact, have a fire to keep him warm. Um, Secret Fire, what are some other things that you have made or done that people might be familiar with? Any modules, any you know, other work? Yeah, uh, I work on Token Magic exclusively. This is my uh, only module, uh, but um, a big one, I think. Uh, and. Um, all, all the experience uh, I could um, I could bring uh, to the Foundry uh, core uh, system. Uh, parts will be from Token Magic, my Token Magic experience. And uh, yeah, Token Magic uh, is a module that uh, concentrates on uh, applying uh, special effects to tokens, tiles, uh, drawings, uh, and templates. And um, I think that uh, it's used uh, by uh, maybe uh, 
a, a lot of the Foundry community. <laughs> And I, I know it's appreciated, and uh, and it's, it's very cool. And sorry for my English, <laughs> with my French accent. No I need to apologize. <laughs> your your French accent really doesn't sneak up on us, but I will say that uh, it's better than my French. Your your English is better than my French. <laughs> Now, Matt, now that the secret is out, if we could just change Secret Fire's name to just Fire. Yeah. No. Oh, crap. <laughs> oh, Matt, you're full you photo ready. <laughs> secret Fire or Ludovic, it's, it's good for me. <laughs> um, all right. Well, since we've introduced our new team member, uh, very excited to have Secret Fire here. Although you're here part time, right? Not full time? Yeah, it's uh, in the part time. Fifty percent. We're we're going to get a lot of value out of that fifty percent. Yeah. I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We'd like to spend, you know, wrap up the the year talk with the whole staff here to talking about, you know, what's Foundry been up to in the last year. You know, how the team is certainly a lot bigger than when we started in twenty twenty one. Um, Andrew, how many people of Oh, there's an alpaca. Everyone say hi to the alpaca. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, Andrew, how many people here were here at the start of the year? I think just you and Cobalt oh. and Nap? I got screen flip owned. On my end, it looked like I was pointing at the alpaca, and on Twitch end, it looks like I was just being an idiot. <laughs> Roman, I was like putting my finger in your ear and trying to point at the alpaca. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I got so distracted by that. Uh, you were asking about completely the, thrown. Yeah, completely thrown. You're asking about the the size of the team at the beginning of the year. Yeah, how many people were here at the beginning of the year? Yeah, so I, I think we had Naf and Roman, um, at who joined the team late in 2020, and then everyone else is new since then. So it's been a, you know, more than doubling. Do you feel like that doubling has gone well? Do you feel like there's any growing pains? We've got one dev I'm not so sure about, but... Uh, uh, I know, Kim, but you gotta love Kim, right? Um, no, it's gone, it, it's gone so well. It's gone so well. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tell people to expect the same, you know, rate of, of growth uh, in 2022, but, um, you know, I, I think this team size is one that I think has worked really well. Uh, at least I feel like it was a really nice um, number of people to be working with during the V9 dev cycle. And I think we did a great job of staying on top of everything and kind of achieving the, you know, the big objectives that we had. And I think V9 has come out really well. There's a lot of work, you know, still to do, but um, I think, yeah, it's it's been, it's been really effective. And I think everyone has, has contributed in such a big way. Um, and I, I hope, I mean, obviously I have a lot of pride in, in the software and, and where it is right now, but I hope that everyone else on the team, I think is, is also feeling a lot of pride over, over how the V9 release came together. I think it's in a really good place. Uh, the fact that we managed to pull it off right before the holiday season kicked in, a lot of work came together for the team to make that happen. So I'm really proud that we've we've managed to make it so, as it were. Yeah, incredibly proud of, of what we pulled together. V9 is easily the best so far. And it went well enough that everybody actually got to take time off afterwards and not bug fix fu furiously for That's a week also afterwards. True. <laughs> there are definitely some bugs that, you know, have been uh, reported and, and you know we appreciate all of that and we have a an upcoming patch that will be addressing a number of them but it hasn't been um, you know it hasn't been anything that's like so critical that we've needed to drop what we're doing and like rush out the patch and I think that is a bit maybe unprecedented for Foundry. <laughs> uh, we probably have a bit of a track record of like uh, you know panic fixing something but uh, we didn't this time, and I think that's that's great. Now, I'm sure team growth is not the only growth that's happened in 2021. Um, obviously, you know, without 
giving full numbers like you know do you have, do you have anything you want to give people on like how foundry has grown outside of the team i know we work with yeah. a lot more publishers i know yeah. we, you know um yeah sure so uh I, I don't know the best way to to summarize this necessarily but uh certainly we grew the most that foundry has ever grown in 2021 um and part of that is because 2020 wasn't a full year uh, the software released in may of 2020 but um you know we we added more users in 2021 than we did in 2020 and that was a big success um and so the you know the size of our active user community is more than doubled um which was you know a lot of uh work put into to make that happen and to you know scale our ability to support that in terms of all of the amazing moderators and helpers on discord and um you know the team doubling as well and, and everything else so um yeah it was a huge year of growth just not just for the team but for foundry overall and so there's um yeah there's there's just so many people using the software now it's really amazing to see um and yeah it's something that we take a lot of pride in it's very um yeah, it's very fulfilling. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. It's it's been a great career change. <laughs> That's so weird. I mean, I it, it blows my mind still thinking that like I changed my career to do this, but the fact that other people on the team are willing to sort of change what they're doing professionally in order to work on this product. I think that's also like super surreal. Uh, and like the fact that there's such a great group of people that like wants to work on this, uh, you know, with me and, and do that professionally. That's like, how did that happen? Uh, that's really weird. Yeah, that's a good question. What was everyone doing before they worked on Foundry? Andrew, why don't you start out? Uh, I was doing... Uh, which, which data science and machine learning um, to build statistical models for forecasting and predicting customer demand. Bit of a, bit of a pivot, yeah. <laughs> bit of a pivot. Naps? Uh, I was previously a uh, G GPS surveyor for a company that handled unexploded ordnance. Uh, bit of a change there in field. Yeah, a bit of a pivot. <laughs> oh, that, that, that sounds about the same. Cobalt? I was a freelance writer for Onyx Path Publishing uh, the year prior. And then before that, I was uh, violently unemployed. <laughs> Fist fighting in the streets. Right? Yes, yeah, for, for change, <laughs> loose change. Fighting raccoons for anything I could get. Before Foundry, I was working at a finance technology company um, on a very slow project of turning old green screen mainframe code into a slightly more modern REST API, which came with all the fun you would imagine finance regulations to have. <laughs> Kim? I was working uh, doing it's it was um like optimization problems so we used uh we used we worked on a piece of software which solved like the traveling salesman problem using heuristic uh simulated annealing and just did that very fast and there's all sorts of business logic that we put on top of that as well so that's what i was working uh on doing for a good good few years before before foundry Maybe I know maybe. what you, some of what you were doing, Matt, was, but outside of your videos. <laughs> I need to really, like, French up what I was working on so that it sounds nearly as cool as your old stuff. Uh, hey, you know, Cobalt said he fist fought for loose change, so I'm... <laughs> exactly, that's badass. <laughs> please, uh, please, it wasn't fists, it was knives. <laughs> yeah, knife fighting possums in people's backyard <laughs> for a fistful of cat food. It was rough. But you pulled through and look at where you are now. Exactly. <laughs> really turned it around. <laughs> but uh, I used to work in the marketing department for a company that does e-commerce fraud detection using machine learning and other buzzwords. Let's three more buzzwords. Go. Uh, 
machine learning, uh, blockchain, One, uh, NFT. We weren't using NFTs three. though. <laughs> oh. Or the blockchain, actually. <laughs> All right, maybe but, I should have been slightly more specific in my buzzword criteria, but that's fine. All right, Secret <laughs> Fire, the you, you, one who most recently joined us. What were you? What I mean, you're still doing halftime. So, what were you doing before this? Oh, it's a it's a long story. So, um, I was a hobby game uh, shop owner. Uh, for uh, five years uh, and it's my hobby uh, curriculum vitae my hobby CV and then for my computer science uh, um, skills so uh, I, uh, I worked uh, for uh, game engines in DirectX 4 and 5 so it was exclusively 2D uh, in the past I worked uh, for a uh, software editor in photography, uh, professional uh, software for uh, photographs, um, and uh, in banks, uh, f uh, in um, big data. And uh, now in uh, software editor specialized in logistics big logistic for uh, big trademarks. I think I think one commenter summarizes this very well. What I'm hearing is that everyone was doing really technical, excruciating work for large companies in finance, and then said, wait, what if I just have fun instead? <laughs> yeah. so more fun. Yeah. Not too far off. Oh, that's, that's so true. Yeah, fun. Yeah. If, uh, I like if, my if, you, if you can have like fun and make it work, you work, it's, it's, it's even. It's even. Yeah. I okay. think it is worth, it is worth noting though, that um, while this is really fun, I think the team has bought into that and has paid that back by working really hard. And I think that, um, you know, it's not something that we take for granted that we're able to do this. Um, and I think that, uh, being able to do something that is really fun makes it easier to put in that effort, I think. But uh, yeah, everyone's everyone's really giving giving a lot to to try and um, accomplish our goals, and that's been really amazing. Yeah, the so there, there are some hard days. There are some days that's like when we work 10, 12 hours and you know crack through a hundred bugs in like three days, and other days it's like oh we're gonna hang out and we're gonna try to you know play test something new. We're going to, you know, get together and do a stream. Um, it has, it's a wide breadth of experience. There's, there's an advantage and a downside to enjoying what you do for a living in that what I'm doing right now is essentially what I was doing before I was hired and would probably be what I'd continue to do if I was no longer working for the company. So it's easy to end up accidentally putting in 20, 30 hours over the normal scheduled hours that I try and have for myself. It's when you enjoy what you do, it it's easy to lose time. I would like to clarify, Andrew does not ask us to work these kinds <laughs> of hours. I would we do yeah. it because we want to. Yeah, and not because we're made to. to stop. Well, he just gives I, us the rope to hang ourselves, that's all. Yeah, I think that's probably it. I mean, I, I, I want everyone on the team to have good balance and good harmony in their lives, but I think it is tough because we all just are enjoying it and it's easy to get stuck into a thing. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't necessarily set a good example because I probably don't have very good boundaries between Foundry and the rest of my life. But um, yeah, I think... Uh, it, None of us, I, I think we're doing a good job of not getting into sort of a burnout territory. And so I think, you know, as long as we're avoiding that and, you know, maintaining some harmony, I think this is a ride that we're all just enjoying being on. It ultimate, ultimately, it comes down to, we're not working on this software because, you know, we're paid. We are paid quite well, but the, the money's not the, motivator the motivator is to make the best software and best community we can and that 
just goes a long way. Yeah, definitely. When your boss is right there in the trenches with you working the same hours you were, it's yeah, yeah. it's easy to stay motivated. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Foundry's foundation is just so good that uh, it's really easy to just sit, sit on top of that and and add more and fix all fix the fix the bugs a bit tidy um which is a big contrast to my old job which was like a legacy piece of software which which is the complete opposite so it's <laughs> it's really refreshing every day to work on on foundry and that makes it very easy to to lose yourself in it for sure there's also something magic about working on foundry and then turning around and getting to use it to run your games and getting to see the the result of everyone's hard work it, it really hammers home just how cool what we're doing is i know a lot of us had jobs where you know we'd put in the work and then we'd send it off and then we'd never really see the end result or we'd see only bits and pieces of it for foundry we see it every day with our game yeah i was not executing um large-scale trades in financial software believe it or not <laughs> Not even GME. Um, not even GME. It was really funny though. I worked there during the GME thing, and it was really fun to watch like people working on fintech and like this the established people that people were like, "Yeah, down with these people." They were like, "Yeah, let's go GME." <laughs> yeah, I think one thing that's um, been kind of a, a prevailing influence for the whole prod the whole project ever since it was just getting started and it's something that like still remains true and is really unique is that we are um you know we're making something that that we want to use uh and i mean we are making something for the community and for our customers and that's not to say that we don't prioritize what our customers want or what creators want we we definitely try and do those things but um ultimately the the kind of recipe of foundry vtt that's ended up working out is you know get a bunch of people who are really passionate about playing role-playing games online together and you know people who have technical skill to make a, a platform for it and build the platform that you wish you had uh, and then, you know, keep building the platform to be even closer in, in, and better to what you wish you had. And, and I think while we're all quirky and unique and have different preferences and have different play styles and like different game systems, um, you know, we are, we have enough in common with other people who like playing tabletop role-playing games online that, that you, know, you know, focusing on building the product that we want is actually something that turns out to be really appealing to to a lot of other people too, and that's uh, that's pretty unique and it's pretty rare. Usually, usually you have to you know make compromises to build the the thing that is the right thing to build for your customers isn't necessarily the thing that you would otherwise like be wanting to do. And I think there's an there's a rare amount of harmony in this space between those two things, and that's I think that's really unusual. I'm inclined to agree. Uh, the The fact of the matter is, we we use the software, so we are equally we're equally motivated because most of what the community wants is stuff we also want and have wanted. Some of the requests we see most often emailed in or on the Discord or Reddit, it's it's all stuff that we've had either in the backlog of GitLab issues with plans around it, or it's stuff that we ourselves are motivated to do, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, there's so much we want to do. We always run into the priority problem. I would like to, I think there's an, an interesting question in chat from Quizit Nisbin about um, who asks, you know, other than continuing to make Foundry amazing, do you have plans to try and beat back the competition that will inevitably crop up? Um, I understand what you're going for with that question, but it is important to say, like, our philosophy has always been to kind of look inwardly, not 
outwardly, so we, we don't necessarily worry about what others are doing um, because we're too busy focused on what we want to do and what we think we should be doing. And it's such a big and exciting list. Um, you know, and going to what Kim said, I think the fact that we are all bought into the foundation of the software and that we have a strong foundation to build on, it's letting us like really do a lot of things relatively quickly and to keep making things better. And I think like that velocity would only get slowed down if we if we were just too distracted by saying like, oh, how do we, you know, how do we somehow prevent or discourage someone else from doing something? We don't really worry about that. It's it's totally fine for other you know, businesses or companies to exist in this space and to create, you know, amazing products themselves. And I think, you know, that that's good for everybody. And, um, you know, that's not a bad thing, but we, that's not the way that we think about prioritization. You know, we're just focused on, on making Foundry as good as we possibly can. Yeah. I mean, how many people on the staff own Tailspire? Because we're like, oh, that's really cool. Like just, yeah, just because look, we don't look at Tailspire and say, oh man, we got to start making 3D mode for Foundry. You know, that's Tailspire's thing. Uh, we look at Tailspire and say, that's really cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's something to be said for the fact that we don't even really view it as a competition. It's just because, because we want to make this software the best we can, there's no... It's not like we look at Roll20 or look at Fantasy Grounds or look at any of the other virtual tabletops uh, that are out there. We're not we're not looking at them, looking at features, going, hey, we should pick that up. It's we just want to do what we're going to do, and if it happens to if it happens to you know surpass features other virtual tabletops offer, well, that's better for us. Um, <coughs> I'll also grant that. We have a very non-competitive attitude, especially when it comes to our Discord, with the exception of the looking for group rooms and, and stuff like that. Uh, you can talk about Fantasy Grounds, you can talk about Roll20. We have moderators that still use Roll20 for their games. It's, it's just a matter of, we want to make what we're going to make. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. If, if you want to play, go ahead. If you're, if you're trying to solve the same problem, which is virtual tabletops, you inevitably end up converging on similar solutions and features anyway. So that, that generally is just what happens. So we just build what, what we think is good, and, and often that invites comparisons, but that's not really the goal. I want people to play the, their tabletop games in the place that makes the most sense for them. Sometimes that's Discord chatbot. Sometimes that's, you know, in person with dice. That's you know, awesome. Sometimes that's, you know, I, I love it when it's Foundry. I want Foundry to be the best or a great place to play most things. But the, you know, the reality is there's plenty of people that have existed for like 10 years and have all of the you know, premium content you want for that game system ready to go. That's probably going to be the place to go. But Foundry is buy once, play it all you want on all these different systems. We don't have to be the best in every system. We just have to have a system that you think is the best. Google Sheets? No, you should not. No, I changed my mind. You should not play tabletop RPGs on Google Sheets. That's the wrong way to play. Nope. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I bet Google Sheets. I have I have run plenty of games using Google Sheets. That's a that's a good place for a makeshift character sheet when you when you don't have anything else. It, it has an API. I did. I, I think I way back in the beta days, I was toying with the idea of like running using it as like a to store importing character sheets from mm. Google Sheets because it does have an API. So we have a uh, a pair of questions. One I'm going to get to first, and it's just a real quick. Uh, what is the next Foundry 1.0 or 0.10? Uh, there's no point anymore to anything. No, um, <laughs> really. <laughs> the, the, there's no there's no decimals in our versioning system, uh, other than separating the build number from the version number. It's version nine. That is V9. Uh, and we are currently on stable build 237, I think, Eight. 238. Um, so yeah, you can 
you can put to rest the debate over when Foundry's going to hit 1.0. Uh, we're not. We blew past it. Yeah. Uh, the other question, and, and this one's a bit deeper, uh, is what was the most surprising or unexpected development that happened this year, either in terms of community feedback or product development? Anybody want to take that first? Most surprising what? <laughs> development. Uh, oh, right, I see. You know, I'll just go open up going to PAX was unexpected and a lot of fun and I met a lot of cool people and we made a lot of cool connections with other companies that I don't think we ever would have otherwise um, and we got to do a panel and that was a lot of fun um, I, I, I certainly had never expected to <laughs> do that kind of thing and it was a surprise when it came up as an option and I felt like it went really well and I'm excited to do it again in the future I'm trying to think back on this year and go, what's the most surprising thing that I either participated in or witnessed? The most surprising thing I immediately went to, what was, I think it was an issue with Let's Encrypt or SSL certificates or something that had to get oh, fixed. Shit. That was an unpleasant surprise, but it was incredibly surprising when it happened. It was surprising. We got that fixed like within yeah. two or three hours and like yeah. we reached out to let's encrypt support like we were like it was uh, pretty yeah, quick uh, we reached out to let's uh, encrypt support boundary. and they're like oh we're foundry fans we're yeah. gonna like raise that was actually very good. prioritize fixing this <laughs> also yeah. john doom has hit on exactly why this question is hard looking back on this year's difficult 2021 was like six years long yeah <laughs> i think that like in, in terms of um features that we added in 2021 there was a a lot of like big features that kind of didn't necessarily surprise me um that we that we launched but there were a couple that you know weren't necessarily expected i think that um like the amazing lighting in v9 was one that we hadn't necessarily planned for, but, um, you know, Ludovic came to us with a prototype of the idea um, and the opportunity to change the way that the shaders were working to achieve like a much more elegant aesthetic was something that um, felt like too much of a good opportunity to pass up. Um, I think, you know, if we had done that, we, we probably would have focused on a, a different, you know, major feature of V9 instead. I don't know what that feature would have been, but I'm really happy that we did the lighting that we did because I think it is just, you know, so much better. Um, so that was like an interesting one that I hadn't really expected us to prioritize. Um, but now that we've done it, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I am expecting us to prioritize because now we have this foundation to build on. Um, so, you know, it, it's about sort of seeing some of those opportunities as they come up, I guess. Yeah, the V9 uh, lighting engine update was really out of the blue. Sorry, I interrupted. No, oh, good. I saw good. someone had like 12,000 tile they were using to make up a map in the community and they were like, oh, it only loads, life. it takes four seconds to load now. It's like, that's yeah. awesome. Like, why? What are you doing with 12,000 tiles? He's, he's you got don't a need that many, I promise. He uses a tile, I think, for each hex, and yeah. maybe oh, one. Yeah. It's a world he used map. to do the Fog of War as well. Yeah. I think that was a tile. So that's really cool, out of individual but hex tiles. wow. Yeah. That's our uh, friendly community member, Sky. He's uh, He's been around longer than I have, in fact, and really friendly dude has strong opinions on hex maps and how they should be run <laughs> and an impressive amount of uh impressive amount of tiles is the only the only way i can put it it's just test five seconds four seconds that's really impressive that's fair 
Yeah, it used to be like fifty. <laughs> Uh, yeah, actually, I don't, I don't know what sure. he said. Yeah. I don't know how, how long he said it used to load in. Based on the other test, I'm guessing around there. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I think we're all surprised card support won, right? Like, that was really a silent majority. That was not a surprise. <laughs> that was the <laughs> least surprising. Surprise, yeah. Thoroughly expected, I, I... but... <laughs> Working on key bindings was a surprise, um... We, I don't think we had any plans to do that originally, and then suddenly there was two libraries made by the you know, community developers, uh, which normally is great and fine, like competition's okay, but it was causing a weird, like some modules used A and some modules used B, and they would, con like, so modules built on those things would then, like, conflict because like oh i want to integrate with this module but they use the other keybinds library and they don't work well together and it's like we had to fix that um i pitched that we had to fix that but i was really hoping someone else would do the work um and boy did that feature just really oh it's still go it's still going it won't let me just move on i feel like cody's relationship with like community suggestions has really evolved since joining the team <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so much easier to make suggestions than to fulfill them yeah, yeah keybind doesn't, I think, on the surface doesn't seem that difficult but when you get into keyboard layouts and all of that it actually becomes a disaster <laughs> well let's not use the, that word <laughs> Well, the, the, well, the, 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 the browser, the browser landscape yeah. is a bit of a disaster. Well, that so, that is true. Yeah. yeah. But for these keyboard APIs, and... another thing that was pretty unexpected uh, was that you know we we created the the Demon Queen Awakens adventure, which was fun. We had a lot, a lot of fun doing that, and I'm really proud of it. I think it's a really great sort of you know four shot yeah, sort of mini mini adventure. Um, and, you know, we will be releasing a, a sort of final release version of that sometime early next year. Uh, it is currently in, in Patreon playtest, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, that was, that was really cool to do. It's, you know, sort of build something that's specifically designed for Foundry to use all of its best features. And um, yeah, we'll be releasing a, a V9 update of the playtest very soon. It has, um, you know, redone lighting to use all the, the shiny V9 effects, which is going to be very yeah. nice. Demon Queen was like, the genesis of that was we did a like one shot with the community and Atro's like, mm, and maybe instead of running some uh, existing content, I'll just kind of whip up some content real quick. And then he ran it and um, people were like, well, this is really good, Andrew. You should like, you know, we should publish this. Uh, and then like four grueling months later, uh, Demon Queen emerged from <laughs> the cage <laughs> and the playtest did or not the playtest but the the one shot itself or the the community event that happened that was uh that was also kind of surreal because we were we were laying tracks in front of the train while it was in motion yeah it was uh andrew gave me a thousand word synopsis that was like hey here's the here's the adventure uh get out in front of this we're running next weekend and it was just like <laughs> we just hammered out as much as we yeah. could and then let's do this boss and then from there, we'll do the next boss once they're in that direction. It was just, it, it was wild. It was, it was fun though. I have to share the story of while we were at PAX. Um, and Andrew, I'm sure is tired of hearing me share this story already, but one of our <laughs> wonderful community members, Nork, um, was, had set up a TV and an Airbnb. He rented and took to play Foundry. He was trying to get material plane working with the little iris sensors. Sadly, that didn't get going, but you, you know, it's still Foundry running on a table. Um, and he had an adventure planned for using material plane and we weren't sure it was going to work that night. And within the course of two blocks, uh, Andrew went from maybe we should have a backup plan to having sketched out a little one shot adventure of people sharing the bodies. What's the monster called? Um, Edmonds. Ettons. They were two, yeah, they, they were independent heads on the Ettons, and he had like sketched out the mechanics. We get back, and he spends like 20 minutes on his laptop pulling up maps and such. We play this like one to two hour adventure, and it like hung together pretty well. Uh, we're not publishing it. You can't bully us into publishing it. No, 
but it was a lot of fun and, and I, I have a lot of respect for how quickly that came together <laughs> well I, I think love the, I, I love the um, improvisational aspect of tabletop RPGs that's like part of my, my favorite thing about it I think my um, my biggest surprise of 2021 is how many publishers are starting to attach to Foundry as a uh, company. How many are starting to look at us as actual uh, ways they can, as an actual way they can share their content and reach a broader community and audience. Um, we've got we don't really have news of partnerships that we can share at this time but we have some pretty surprising stuff coming in 2022 that i think will excite a lot of people and we had some that already came out in 2021 um, we had savage worlds we had uh... now nah, you know this better than I do. <laughs> you ran out i of, knew you ran out of examples very fast there Kirk. i mean the partnership with cubicle seven with uh, Free League with uh, we've had um, most recently Dean Rowan uh, there's just there are so many different companies that are starting to just jump on the foundry train and go wait we can sell it ourselves and just make it work with, with foundry VTT awesome you see Andrew I'm very afraid that half the names of my head that are rattling around are not public yet, so I refuse <laughs> to share them. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. For those wondering, because we often say, you know, we we when we have news to share, you'll hear it. Um, there's, we of course often meet with a variety of publishers. I'll say, at least once a month, we have a different publisher we're talking to. And uh, obviously, we can't share everything about that the second we know about it, because then the community becomes uh, expectant that something's coming soon. But content production takes time, and we don't want to get people excited for something that might not actually pan out. So there's... There's a lot often going on behind the scenes that we can't talk about until we reach a point where it's actually concrete. I saw another question. I think we can move on. Um, what is everyone's like big hope or dream for 2022? Be it for a core feature or some, you know, a publisher or a you know something that we just accomplish as a company or people. Um, Secret Fire. Let's go start with you. Sorry. I didn't understand the... <laughs> What's one of your big hopes for 2022 for Foundry? Oh, my big hopes? Um, oh, it's it's hard to to answer, uh, to to respond to that. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I'm I would like uh, to to be able to apply effects, special effects to tokens. <laughs> and hey, you know, he's something near and dear to his heart. heart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, mine is actually one that has kind of, sort of started work on it, making adventure export and import a little bit easier. There's some good work underway right now to make that a lot better. And since I spend a lot of time trying to explain to Patreon creators and stuff like, okay, this is how you make a foundry module. This is how you can export your content. Having uh, less to explain there would be uh, very nice. <laughs> and it's yeah. getting I mean, smoother. We always, I, when we're prioritizing features, it's like, what can we do to help content creators? What can we do to help publishers? What can we do to help developers? What can we do to help, you know, the general user, new users? It's always hard, but we did bring them at least Patreon integration, which has been nice. Yes. Yeah, and that's we, something that testing has gone, testing has gone well with the Patreon integration, and we're 
we're getting close to being ready to roll it out for um, creators outside of our sort of internal test group to, to use uh, if they want to opt into that. So um, that's going to be nice to see that system continue to grow uh, next year. And hopefully it, it ends up really being one that a lot of uh, amazing creators on Patreon end up, you know, feeling like is a great way for them to get content to Foundry users um, through their subscription. So yeah, I'm excited to see where that goes. I just finally had a opportunity to use the system myself. And normally I, in the past, I'd have to make like, all right, here's the public post. Here's the private post for this tier with the link. Here's the other private post with the link that you know, will open up in two weeks. And now it's just like, oh, I can make one public post and Foundry mm -hmm. takes care of it for me. Really reduced my effort. But, yeah, uh, I experienced the same thing because I updated my Patreon maps module for V9 for all the new lighting and it was nice to be able to just sort of post that update publicly and say like here's what i did here's all the stuff you can get you know just link your account on the website to patreon and, and you can get it I, I totally agree with that like not having to have like being able to publicly share the thing you've created but rely on the integration to to handle access control is was really nice okay mm, it's tough because we have like we have a stringent priority process that will be coming up for v10 right you'll poll users and we'll have our own internal priorities so i don't want to talk about something which might be not even happen in 20, have a hope 22. share hope what's, there's always v11 too what's something that you personally hope that we can get to sometime uh, in the next year I, I think the the application refactor as as like a standard one will be will be challenging but also good. There's like a lot of exciting potential there. Um, my personal like my personal interest is probably like a mobile support. That'd be something that, that I think I'd probably uh, I'd jump into myself. So I'll I'll, I'll go with that one. Um, yeah, but they might be slightly PAX, related. Like walking into PAX, my you know level of support for mobile support was like down here. After PAX, it's like up here. It's like mm. we're not that far off from having okay mobile like support. You know, not great, but okay. I'd like to get us at least okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Someone mentioned event triggers. Uh, that's a good one too. But I think that's Andrews. I don't want to take that from him. <laughs> <laughs> he knows me so well. Yeah. Mine, of course, is easy. Merch store. Merch store. Show them the shirts, Kevin. <laughs> Matt, come on. Uh, yeah, show them the Merch on. store. Let's let's oh, launch the 2022, you. baby. Please support the merch store. Please make it successful. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> very good. Andrew thinks this is silly, but I think it's gonna sell at least ten shirts. Ten. I think we will. I think we will sell at least ten shirts. I think that is a good way to way to set sandbag the goal. <laughs> set, low, set low goals and exceed them. That's my. That's that's how I go about life. Uh... And we would be remiss to not mention that Roman did the fantastic design for both of these shirts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Where he handed um, out a bunch of shirts. That packs and it was really cool to see people walk around people we didn't know walk around and wearing them the next day that foundry and the shirts we were handing out resonate with them enough that they're like i want to wear this tomorrow that is very cool uh cody and i have been talking about designs and we're hoping to get a variation of the design that matt's wearing <laughs> that's a non-pax version of this classic uh D, D map out for merch which also means that anyone who got a shirt at PAX, you're going to have a one-of-a-kind shirt. That design, uh, you're not going to see it again. Cobalt? Limited edition. Oh, man. Um, I, I have a I have a huge uh, hope wish list for Foundry. I'm a sucker for special effects. You know, revamped weather, more light shader, uh, uh, more... Just, just more anything lighting would make me happy. But just, I hope that Honestly, I just hope that I'm still with the team in a year. <laughs> wow, that's so fatalistic. 
right now. I'm, I'm kidding. I know I will be. But um, no, I'm I'm super excited for the lighting engine. I know that Ludovic has been showing off some of the the new prototype stuff to the staff side, and like if you guys think the V9 lighting engine is cool now, oh my god, just wait. It's so cool. The stuff that's coming. So yeah, they, anything lighting, I'm a huge sucker. Andrew. Uh, well, I think, and I'll, I'll say this clearly that it, it has no bearing on our eventual prioritization. This is me as a, as a foundry user wishing some things might exist, but, uh, I do really want to do event triggers. Um, I also really want to do like a, an official approach for, um, seen levels for like multi you know level stories of, of buildings or phases of battle maps or things like that I, I really want to have some core support for that um those are two features that i'm personally like really excited about um but i don't think that the the timing will be right to prioritize them for v10 because i think we have a lot of things, important things to do in V10 that are maybe like a little bit more fundamental, but I don't know. We'll see. I, I do. I don't expect V10 to be our only 2022 release cycle. So um, maybe, maybe I, I, sometime in the in the year we can we can turn our our gaze towards event triggers or levels or something like that. I would be very excited if that were the case, but I make no promises. We are gonna have to take each event as it comes, and uh, each each release as it comes, and and think about prioritization at the time. And I think, for me, I don't really have one big feature that I'd like to see in the next year, but I think I'd like to see a lot of improvements in general. Just a bunch of we we've got a fairly large backlog of I'll say small issues ones that are not really the kind we can dedicate a whole update to but which would improve quality of life kind of everywhere for everybody so it's it's very much I think I think my one feature that I hope we go for is kind of a an overall improvement of UI and UX for pretty much everything just there's so many little changes that we could bring in that would make life easier for everybody and and ourselves so yeah that's that's what i think i'm i'm looking forward to is ability to to just get some of the improvements that we've been looking at for a while out of the backlog and done that wouldn't otherwise be focused do you think it's andrew is it, should we start talking about what our thoughts are for v10 or is it too early for that I think probably, probably it's a little bit early. Uh, I mean, it's not right. that early, but I do think that what what we'll want to do is um, explore, you know, po poll our Patreon community. That's going to be coming up in early January. We'll post that poll. Uh, and I think we're going to have a slightly different set of options uh, than what was on the last poll. Well, some things will be there again, but I think, um, you know, maybe we want to give a set of options that will be a little bit more consistent with, you know, the central theme of the V10 update and then see what users are most excited about. Uh, and then hopefully choose some things that will link really well with some of the core infrastructure improvements that we want to make. Um, but Do you, you want know, to keep the theme or you want to keep them hanging? Well, we haven't come up with that list yet. I think I think a number of things from the V9 poll will will resurface, although some of them may not. Um, like maybe some that were not very heavily voted on in V9, we might we might curate a list a little bit. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Certainly, I, I think one thing that I have made no illusions about mentioning is that we are prioritizing. Um, extending some of our new lighting features towards vision in v10 and that's one of the that's probably going to be like the first big project that uh that secret fire will work on um so that's that's something that i think we have kind of mentioned before but beyond that um 
you know, we're going to need to think about um, what the community vote is and what we think is most important in terms of reinforcing the foundation of the software, which those are internal conversations that we haven't really had yet. So, um, you know, I think that's probably a bit too soon to say. So short answer, we know V10 is going to happen. We Beyond there, that, there will be a V10 and we think it's going to have some fancy and fun tools for token vision. It will um, have featured. It will have a feature. Possibly I think our releases are trending smaller over time as well, so V10 might come even faster than V9 did. Um, we here's hoping. Might... Go ahead. Oh. I said, here's hoping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We might even get out... This is certainly not even a problem. This is just a hope. We might even get out three releases in 2022. Who knows? We'll see. One thing we talked a lot about internally that I think it might not be labeled as like a flagship feature of V10, but we've done a lot of work um, discussing new user experience as an area that is a key focus uh, for us to improve. And I think whether it becomes a big enough thing that we say like this was what our focus was in V10 or whether it's something that we kind of are just working on as part of V10 as not necessarily like a headline feature. Either way, I think we're gonna we're gonna keep working on on new user experience to make the software more approachable for people who pick it up for the first time. Uh, that's something that we're definitely focused on. Yeah, and Kim did some of those features in the, at the end of V9 as well. Um, Kim, do you want to talk about some of the features that help people who are first using Foundry? Uh, sure. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's seen them. Uh, if you start a new world now, there'll be some chat messages which give you like the very, very basics so that if you're one of the people who hates reading instructions to anything, then it's just it just gives you the bare minimum you need to get started and start playing around. I know some people prefer to just play around with things rather than rather than reading big guides and stuff. So they're there. Matt did like a ton of work in identifying all the new user experience stuff. And I picked a couple of those that were that were easy enough that we could fit into V9. Um, so there'll definitely be more of that. And there'll probably be more sophisticated stuff that is a, that, that isn't uh, confined to, to, to easy things like little <laughs> tip, tip messages and stuff like that. We can hopefully do some some more some more involved ones yeah i think one of the changes you made will hopefully be useful to pretty much everybody who gets started with foundry because i remember i had the same issue when i got started of like trying to create a world and then being like oh i don't have a system installed i have to go install a system and then i can go back to the creative world That's... now ah uh, yes That's right. with kim's great work it starts you on the game system screen it gives you some text it's like hey install a system and then pop over to create a world and he also made it so uh your data path is already filled in for you automatically, which is just beautiful. Our stream has turned into a modern horror uh, event where Nath has just been <laughs> devoured by the, the man-eating alpaca of the Great White North. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's gonna be hard to replace. Sorry, I just switched my camera off because I'm grabbing more wood. <laughs> We can't just watch the peaceful farm background. Mm. Yeah, can't can't stream math grabbing his wood. <laughs> you gotta keep it no. family friendly. Oh dear. I was oh waiting dear. for that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if you didn't know, Nath's um, family runs a ranch called Farago Ranch. Uh, they have a Patreon where you can get daily alpaca photos. It's very cute, especially when they have new. Um, what are the babies called? Oh no. Baby they, they have a name for alpaca babies, but small packets. Uh, but they also <laughs> sell uh, their custom homemade um, yarn and such. So I'll find the link for that and drop that in chat if you're looking for things made from the alpacas you yeah. see in the background. And the yarn is very nice. It makes for excellent hats. I don't have mine with me, unfortunately. Mm. Hey, you, you have a hat, Priya. I've been do, I'm being told they're called the Priya. Thank you, people listening in the background. I did not make the hat, but Wendy did make the hat. I really That's liked surprised. small packa. I thought that was very clever, Roman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, so we are about, you know, we're a little over halfway. I think we'll talk a, couple, a bit more amongst us and then open up some questions from the community. Not that we haven't been doing that already, but, you know, if you have particular questions, feel free to start dropping them in. We might start pulling them. Um, Andrew, are you planning a end of year progress report or is this kind of it? I'd like to post something so we don't have like a you know a blog or anything so i tend to use the foundry patreon for that because it you know it's just a place i can post sort of written thoughts it wouldn't be like restricted to to members it just you know would be a public post on patreon i'll probably put something together um over the next week or so i'd like to do a sort of you know end of 2021 start of 2022 state of foundry vtt type post i think that would be nice um it will probably rehash a lot of what we've talked about on this stream, but in maybe written format. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think there'll be anything there particularly revelatory after what we've been discussing as a group, but, uh, yeah, I think and that's a nice idea. Uh, support the Foundry Patreon, um, I dropped the link in chat, patreon.com to Foundry VTT. It gets you access to Demon Queen Awakens um, playtests right now via the Patreon integration. It gets you access to Andrew's battle maps, which is your, what, your collection of things that you make for your campaigns that you bundle up. Mm -hmm. um, it gets you special roles inside the Discord. It gets you access to secret channels that are just kind of like, you know, where we hang out with people, but, you know, it. It Patreon. still is a, you know, a perk. Patreon community feature vote uh, yeah. for upcoming, yeah, you get to vote yeah, for upcoming V10 and um, but don't join it today. Wait until the yeah, first don't gen. don't join it today because you'll end up getting double double build. Thank you, Kim, for mentioning that. Yeah, it builds. Join it today. No, double no, build. <laughs> don't don't get double build. Wait wait until January first or later if you're go if you're thinking about picking it up. So humble. So humble. Um, Even Queen Awakens is really good, too. Yes. I'm actually I'm about also... to run it oh, nice. next week. I am also... It's not It's not close enough to a, a, a playtest for Patreon, but I've been working on a custom game system to, for, for Foundry BTT, um, which has been a lot of fun. It's been kind of a side project that has been very irregular in my ability to put time towards it but uh, it has gotten recently to the point where i've been able to do an internal very early play test with some of mods and helpers in discord uh and so that's um that's fun and, and and once that progresses far enough that i think it would be nice for others to try it that will also be available on patreon yeah let's talk about side projects andrew so you i know you're working on crucible what else have you been doing in your limited free time hmm. well i've lost well, my games after this so yeah i've basically just been like uh working a little bit less for the last you know week and a half uh taking a bit of holiday time which has been nice uh and you know doing a little bit every day but mostly i've just been sort of taking some time off and recharging and um yeah i've been using some of that time off to work on the homebrew system. Uh, I think that's been fun being able to put some time into that, uh, updating the maps module, um, working on, you know, a couple of little like side project features that I'm playing around with prototyping, um, talking with some collaborators in the content developer community who I've got sort of irons in the fire with on potential collaborations. Um, yeah, just sort of like side stuff that has been fun to work on and some less fun stuff, uh, some long needed uh, website uh, improvements for some aspects of the, the website and our internal management tools for various things. So yeah, I don't know, sort of grab bag. Are we going to free code Friday tomorrow? Obviously not late in for, the night. For uh, for those of us who are, are viewing tomorrow as a work day, then yeah, sure, definitely. It's a sort of side project Friday as scheduled. Uh, I probably will use some time tomorrow to work on the homebrew system, so I'm certainly going to gonna do that. Um, some of us have actual work to do, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> it's New Year's. You should take the day off or have fun doing what you're doing. Um, for those who don't know, Freeco... Friday is once a month we 
throw away the prioritization and just work on something we want to work on related to Foundry. That's how we got the um, scrolling text. Uh, what's that feature called? Status effect. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling status text. Scrolling status effects was something they got into V9 because Andrew yeah. did that as a free code thing. Um, some of the tutorial world stuff was, you know, worked on that. It's stuff that we want to do but hasn't been high priority, but we get a chance to, you know, ignore priority for one day a month. Um, always a lot of fun. Roman, what's your, how are your side projects doing? Uh, well, my, my current side project is the completely revamped uh, content creation guide with tile tricks, lighting trick, uh, best ways to wall map, stuff like that. It's been a long, a long project that I've been working on. Uh, I'm not quite done yet, but uh, that's that's my main side project that's been that I, I, I hammer out when I get the chance or hammer on and uh, <laughs> looking forward to getting it done. I recently got a chance, was linking that to someone who was looking to get started with mapping, and I really appreciate the section that's like, here's how you make like a waterfall effect, here's how you make glitter glittering gold, so, you know, big thank you for that. And V9's only made that just so much better. There's so many cool little things you can do with the new lighting engine that, uh, it's gonna be fun. Like Andrew, I have been working on keep getting modules updated, um, you know, just getting things V9 compatible it hasn't been too hard, but like it's been hard to find time. Um, after a lot of work and sitting in the backlog of actually releasing, I got Dungeon Moon out for D&D 5e. Th big thanks to Caligo for helping me figure out how CR makes sense at all. Um, it really doesn't. But it you know, doesn't. We've got, according to the rules in the book, we have it encoded that way, so it's you know, my enough. Patreon, you can go for the next two weeks, grab the D&D 5e integration for Dungeon Moon, piece together your encounters, and search, you know, your celestial burrowers that move up to 60 feet and are lawful good, and then piece together a fair fight for your players. And after two weeks, they'll be free to everyone. Um, I like that module. It's, it's, a, it's a fun one because it's in Foundry, and so it can load all your homebrew and all your adaptations and whatever content you bought, which I always had a problem with these programs in the past that were like, you know, external. It's like, well, I mean, great. You all, you know, the only thing you know how to build is like the SRD. Um, I've also been working on the yeah. sequel to 1001 Fish uh, called Obligatory Fishing Minigame. Uh, <laughs> I showed... Nath and Andrew have seen it, but it is the Stardew Valley style mini game where you tap the button using key bindings um, and you <laughs> try to keep the fish in the bar and it's going to have roll tables connected to it, including 1001 fish. Uh, it's going to be, I'm really excited to launch it, um, but. Please make it easier. No, I mean, we've got to get him a better fish. name for that mod. No. Obligatory fishing mini game is a great name for it. I think it's a pretty good name. <laughs> You'll have to follow it up with obligatory lock picking mini game and mm. uh, <laughs> yeah. Skyrim style. No, yeah. we could actually. I like that. One thing about this is doing these mini games in Foundry mean that your play your character's stats impact the mini game. So. Um, I have a little like, chart uh, written down of, oh, you can't read it, but uh, of like, oh, if you have your better strength, that you capture the fish faster. If you have better deck, your bar move faster. Like, um, so, I don't know. It's just a lot of, the things you can build in Foundry are fun to build. It's quick to build. I can just get code running and UI rendering. Um, and it, it opens up stuff that you couldn't do otherwise you thought that a lot more than i thought you would yeah really i it wasn't expecting that yeah you, yeah it kind of really gives you the keys to do anything and there are definitely things you shouldn't do but <laughs> people do it anyway um <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I for my break. I think I, I, like, oh. I think that the ability to dev irresponsibly is is crucial uh, <laughs> to to the ethos of what we're doing. Not yeah, recommended, it's, but crucial. <laughs> yes, it's it's a hundred percent a draw point for yeah. many many people out there. 
Um, so for my break, uh, I did pings um, right after we released V9 because um, I had some time and uh, it just seemed fun. It's a small little feature that, that we kind of haven't done because the existing offerings have been uh, perfectly good. So, um, but I, I went went and did that. Um, and most of the time spent was just like hand coding the animations for those. So that, that was just really time consuming, but not not particularly complicated. And then, yeah, I've just been uh, taking a break. I watched all four seasons of Castlevania, nice, um, nice. which took, took about three days. So that was good. Um, got to level 200 in Dofus. Which, uh, which I've never done before. That was good too. Um, and I'll probably take some time to do some... Uh, I, I, my modules are already updated for V9 before V9 release, but uh, there's some... Like I want to redesign the NPC and vehicle sheets in Obsidian because I've never been super happy with those. I'll give a crack at those um, in the next couple of days over the weekend as well. Very nice. Yeah. Bye. Uh, I've been working on some adventure development stuff. I have been adding some additional templates to a module that I made that puts a bunch of templates into TinyMC and provides some other like little helper functions for laying out uh, journal entries and all that stuff. And I started working last night on a macro for uh, content creators that will export all of their collections to a given compendium and then also like render WebP thumbnails for it using some code that Andrew put together because I'm not good enough at JavaScript to be able to do that myself uh, and put together Very some nice. other helpful stuff for like flagging actors to specific scenes and stuff like that so hopefully uh, people won't have to like open the console and be able to just do that with a nice dialogue box eventually nice yeah very fun That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, secret fire. Any secret? Any uh, secret side projects? <laughs> um. <clears throat> um. Uh, I have some uh, some secret ideas uh, to improve the lightning system. Or oh, it's uh, it's um, something uh, that is uh, that has begun. Um, and uh, also, uh, if I have uh, extra time to to do some uh, automated testing, uh, nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, and, and I think that um, it would be interesting. Uh, and it's also possible to do automatic testing with graphics and and pixie and all, all things visual. And uh, yeah, I think that's something that uh, that could be interesting to do. And uh, also, I'm preparing a, a new campaign for my players uh, in uh, the universe of uh, Warhammer 40k. Nice. Um, and uh, I'm just beginning the preparation. And, is it? Uh, is your campaign? Uh... Wrath and Glory, or do you play like a homebrew system, or is it sort of an adaptation? It's not yet Wrath and Glory. We are playing in Rock Trader. Okay. Uh, but uh, it's planned to uh, to uh, to convert to Wrath and Glory. Cool. Yeah. Should be easy to do now that uh, Wrath and Glory has official premium content for Foundry. It's good timing. It, it's just perfect timing. <laughs> Nath, what's your latest Icarus project? Uh, well, for a brief period, I was involved with the League of Debs working on a uh, module with the hopes of bringing uh, cards to the canvas. I have since stepped back because I've realized that I've bitten off far more than I can chew, and I'm going to leave it in the capable hands of people who are better at JavaScript than I am. Uh, other than that, I've mostly been trying to finish Metroid Dread before my vacation runs out and hiding from family. 
Hence why you're outside, right? Hence why I'm outside right now. Uh, I'm I'm hoping, perhaps ambitiously, uh, to get the final rewrites on the skills for all ten classes for my tabletop role-playing game done in January. I'm hoping. It's been months. It's been months. I'm looking forward to when we do that Monster Hunter one-shot. And speaking of Metroid, has anyone managed to make a dent in any of their backlogs of games? Steam sale has only added more to my backlog, sadly. Mm-hmm. I started I playing Halo Infinite Control. Overbreak. What's Control? Wait, it's, I, uh, like I actually don't even remember who it's from. Like but SCP. It's, yeah, it's like a third-person shooter, like, force power throwing game with a lot of weird... Uh, abstract concepts where there's like mm-hmm. a federal bureau of control that is doing very weird things with like world events where we're getting like phases from other dimensions and other weird powers and stuff i don't know i haven't gotten that far in yet so the plot is still very there's a lot of floating me. people in these screenshots yeah. i'm looking control at. is yeah. fantastic it is yeah. such a weird game and it's so fun yeah, it's one of the games where I am like hunting down the collectibles because I need to listen to every cassette and like read every document that I find, and I'm just getting more weirded out by it. It feels like very like Twin Peaks and mm-hmm. weird. Control is one of those games where every collectible is worth looking at because it it only makes the setting that much weirder and more interesting. <laughs> Bioshock. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Control won so many awards. Um, well, we answer this last question. If you have a question for us, go ahead and drop it in Twitch chat with bracket question in front of your question so we can start pulling them up. All right, okay. Nath, what games have you been playing? Uh, well, as mentioned, Metroid Dread, I got to try out, um, I also got to try out Andrew's new system in kind of a pseudo playtest yesterday. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm considering starting an Elder Scrolls Online now that I've found out that there is a add-on you can add to hide other players completely. <laughs> other than that, I haven't been playing a whole lot. Oh, actually, I did start on uh, replaying for Red Dead Redemption 2 recently. Nice. Are you still playing that with Ben? Um... Not currently. Maybe uh, we're, we're thinking about going back to it for the online portion in uh, in 2022. Andrew, I, I have I've seen what you've been playing, but yeah, I so I'm, I've actually been spending more of my free time this past like week and a half on the system development than on uh, on video games. But I was. Um, I was playing some good stuff. I like there's I just have such a long backlog of stuff that I like never played because I've been so busy with Foundry. So like the last like three years of gaming has kind of like passed me by and I have like a three year long backlog of computer games I want to play. Um, I uh, played um, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Uh, that was pretty good. I um, re 100 percented uh, Doom. Eternal after they released new DLC and stuff, and I'm playing uh, Mass Effect Legendary because I actually never played Mass Effect 3 before. I played 1 and 2 like a couple of times each, and I never played 3 because I just didn't want to deal with Origin. Um, And so, yeah, I'm kind of enjoying playing Mass Effect 3 for the first time now. I'm still like, I think probably pretty early on in the the game, but uh, What's your build? I'm playing a Sentinel, uh, so it's a mix of like tech and biotic. Um, and yeah, I've been playing through it on Insanity, which is fun, good challenge. Um, wow. It's, it's, not that, it's, no, it's not that bad. It, uh, it's really not that bad. I suppose Sentinel is probably the best for Insanity because you, you need you need those special abilities that target each of the yeah, different Yeah, you need all types. the you need all the can openers because every, yeah. everyone is really tough to damage otherwise. So that's kinda yeah. why I picked it, because you could sort of beat 
you could do something about all of the different defense pools. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's been uh, it's been fun. I, I like I said, I didn't, didn't play three before. You know, heard a lot about it secondhand, but um, you know, I haven't gotten to the controversial parts yet. So you know, we'll see. <laughs> Robert well, JS, if you're doing Paragon or Renegade. Um, so if people are gonna like think this is lame, but it's more of a it's more of a Paragon character. Uh, I, I like I like playing Renegade, but like I feel like um, maybe this is maybe this is just my perception, but I feel like Paragon Shepherd is sort of more like Canon Shepherd, mm -hmm. uh, and so I figure since I hadn't played three before, I was gonna see what the, the Paragon path looked like first, but. Everyone should do a Renegade run. It's a lot of fun, but Paragon's always better. I have never been able to finish a game in a Renegade playthrough, like whether it was KOTOR or Mass Effect or anything. I just feel so sad the minute I have to do the first, like, no, I'm taking all of your money and beating up your kids and stuff. I just can't do it. Really? Yeah. Because, honestly, some games made it easy when all the NPCs just treat you like an asshole the moment yeah. they meet you. You have to win them over Hold on. with good deeds and kindness. I, I'm sorry, you said something, but what I heard was you have to punch them in the face to tell them they're wrong. <laughs> there are some really obvious renegade moments. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I just recently completed uh, Doom Eternal. I slept on that one, but I got it on sale. It was a lot of fun. And we just last play, night... We play some uh, PvP. Yeah, we do. We do. They just oh, released an update to the to the battle mode too, hmm. so it's all it's all refreshed. Um, and then last night I actually beat Days Gone, which is a which is a PlayStation port to PC um, that I would honestly rate uh, as good as Red Dead it, in very different way, but a very similar uh, in in ways comparable experience. A lot of fun. Enjoyed it. I also got oh, Discord. That's the motorcycle zombie game. Mm -hmm. Motorcycle zombie game. It's like Red Dead, but it's. Instead of, you know, cowboys and horses, it's mm -hmm. motorcycles and zombies, but super fun. And then I got Disco Elysium on sale, which I'm looking forward to to ignoring for another year or two, and then eventually playing. <laughs> very good. It's weird, but it's very good. I've heard it's weird, but really good, and that's... Yeah. And then also, uh, Fights in Tight Spaces, a little indie roguelike card battler that's uh, sort of a... Uh, john wick james bond martial arts game like a tile-based martial arts brawler but using card a lot of fun just relief uh super super sucker for card trading roguelike games so that's cool that's very interesting so, someone asked oh, go, okay, ahead. go ahead uh okay so someone asked if um which i thought was good uh if what the best vid uh, what what video game would make a a good tabletop game setting um and i wanted to to come out with a weird one perhaps a little bit obscure which was which is pyre if you've ever played pyre it's one of the super giant games games one of the lesser well-known ones but the setting is actually very cool and it lends itself really well i think to tabletop absolutely game. i think I, most I, of super giants games would do amazingly well a setting yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, their settings are just really cool. Yeah, they yeah. are. That's right. Like, Transistor would be a very cool sci-fi setting. Mm -hmm. uh, but Pyre, yeah. Doom yeah. Eternal, the tabletop game. Doom <laughs> Eternal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'd be very cool. Yeah, so I, I can't explain the setting because I don't think I'll do it justice. Um, but you should, you should check out the game. And I, I would love to run a, a, a game in, in the Pyre setting, definitely. That's a really hard question for me. I don't have an easy answer to that. Yeah, I also don't have an easy answer. I did meet the guy who was working on Pokemon Episodes, um, the tabletop RPG game that he looked at Pokemon Tabletop United. It was like, this is too crunchy. How can I make this more like the TV show? And he did a panel at PAX and I, I got a chance to talk with him and he gave me a copy of the book. Um, so that was cool. I, I have played Pokemon Tabletop Unite before and also thought it was too crunchy. Uh, so it's exciting to see that someone's trying to bring that same kind of fun of, you know, collecting Pokemon to a tabletop game without having turns take five minutes. Yeah.
but uh, dude, I think. I think I'd have to say the Banner Saga. I think I'd like to see a tabletop yeah, yeah. RPG in the Banner Saga setting. I think that'd be neat. Giants and stuff. Yeah, that'd be very cool. I haven't really, um, aside from like having a surface level familiarity with it, I, I really would love to like try playing Vason at, at some point. And I feel like that game system might work well for a sort of Banner Saga style game. Um, at least given some of like the mythological overlap, um, but I'm speculating. I don't know. It's a, it's a game that I'd love to try at some point. I think uh, I, I would like to see uh, a tabletop game setting uh, in the world of League of Legends. Uh, I have seen yeah. the Arcan uh, season on. Uh, on Netflix and so I was it was very very good and uh, with my wife we uh, we uh, we were wondering if it would it would be a very if it would be a very good um, uh, pen and paper or, or tabletop mm. game setting I think kind of like that Magitech <laughs> you yeah. might be interested to know that they teamed up with D&D Beyond to launch an exclusive 5e compatible setting um, in the League of Legends universe oh interesting it, uh, I don't know if you can still get it anymore though yeah I thought they had it and then they had to like shut it down for some reason I'm pretty I don't know the, the specifics for what happened it might still be there uh, let me see if I can find yeah. it I think it might still exist in the homebrew like, uh, you can shut down by the League of Legends community. No, it's it's there's some Ill license issue. They didn't might have the license um, that they thought they had to to run it for longer. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame. I've got an out there uh, answer: Frostpunk, uh, a game of survival uh, against encroaching cold with. Uh, hard decisions of how to get by and how to what is the right decision making moral choices i think is very interesting it would be hard to get right survival games are always difficult but frostpunk has a certain uh brutality that i have always kind of found compelling and like they make you they just make you make unpleasant decisions to survive and that you could you could get a lot of good uh role play out of that that would be good, yeah. Yeah, no, wow. It looks like they, 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 no one said why it's been removed in particular, um, but I had read it at the time, and they, they had custom monsters, they had a whole setting, they had pretty well-rich adventures, they had subclasses. Like, it was really cool, so I don't know why it disappeared. Uh, they were a little bit broken. Yeah, they, the flavor was there. Probably something anyway. to do with the licensing, Jeff. Yeah. I I recently started and beat Halo Infinite, and one of my friends is already like noodling on a campaign setting or like a, a tabletop game in that universe. It's always been a cool universe, and the Infinite really opened it up as a like here's how you can do this. Like, it lends itself well to a tabletop setting since it's no, no longer so linear it's now you know, open world do these missions I could see having a lot of fun doing a, a game in that um, outside of that it's like guns and stuff right yeah yeah. Well, I mean Gups. guns can work right and there's, there's melee weapons um, I've been replaying well I've been playing again GTFO a very tense and spooky game where you go down into a deep dark hole and face and stealth around and shoot some monsters um they finally released version 1.0 of the game and they finally added bots um so i can play with my friend and have a full squad of four instead of just the two of us against a game that was not balanced for two people um so i can actually play the game which is great uh even with four players it had a like one percent pass rate of pass like level three it's very hard and they finally have added checkpoints and bots to make that a little less so you can actually experience more of the game um, so that's been nice i don't mind hard games i really don't right i've played doom eternal i i like it when games challenge me but 
if most of your content's not being seen by more than one percent of your players, that's probably too hard. Invitational, uh, hard game. Yeah, Ooh, getting called Tim, out. What other games have you been playing? Me, uh, I have only been playing Dofus. It's an MMO, so like it, it can eat one hundred percent of your time. So. <laughs> I was playing Final Fantasy XIV and then the expansion came out and you couldn't log in for like a month, but they comped me all that game time, so I'm not too worried about it. Matt? I'd have to say, uh, I y'all have probably gotten sick of me talking about this game, but the Diablo universe is excellent, and considering it's already like class-based with Amazon, Barbarian, Druid, Necromancer, all that, it would be perfect for a TTRPG. But to do a non-Diablo answer, I think The Forest would be cool as a survival horror kind of game. Since you wind up on the island during a plane crash, it's like every character yeah. gets one life. If they die, there's no coming back. And trying to deal Very with the, the weird stuff on the forest might be entertaining, but survival stuff is hard to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. always it. Secret Fire? Any games? Excuse me, to see uh, as a tabletop RPG? Uh, uh, I no, no, that, that you've been playing. Oh, yeah, now, that I'm playing now. Uh, I, I'm very, very old school. And uh, I'm playing old school games. So uh, presently, I'm playing at Bart's Tale, at the Bart's Tale trilogy. Hmm. I don't know if you... Super it's very... Old school. It's super old school, but... Uh, I I have pleasure to play these kind of games. Ludovic uh... just likes playing games that worked on the DirectX versions that he helped contribute to. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I I, I was playing at uh, Bart's Tale uh, first. Uh, in uh, oh, it was maybe uh, thirty-five years. Uh, it was an, an uh, Apple Two uh, A. Uh, a very, it was uh, maybe in France uh, the first computers to be uh, distributed uh, on, uh, uh, for the pu large public. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm playing presently to, uh, to at, uh, at Bart's Tale and um, also a little uh, at Pillars of Eternity, the second, uh, mm -hmm. the second nice. one. Nice. They're good. Fun story about Pillars of Eternity. We have a uh, game system that is being developed. Uh, this was revealed on a previous Hammering It Out episode with Moo Man uh, official coming sometime in 2022, we hope. Mm -hmm. that the, that, that's the official one that they, yeah. that they released with their Kickstarter. It's Excellent. Fig, I think it was, but yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Mm. That's really cool. I, I, I love, a couple. Uh, Go ahead. I, yeah. I really like the, ahead, the, 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 the pillars of eternity. Yeah. It's been super cool for me I to should... see Josh Sawyer using Foundry regularly and like sort of commissioning yeah. the system to be built for it. That's just like a, a real sort yeah. of like fan fan moment for me yeah. uh, on that. I just can't get so much of a kick out of that yeah the streams right he streamed himself like playing on foundry yeah sometimes also you know he'll just sort of do like just chatting streams like working on some like game mechanics for it or you know streaming and playing different games or something like that he's a, he's a cool guy that's very cool got a couple questions from chat um from DZA Joss 8989 has Foundry boomed in some foreign country unexpectedly. Andrew, I think only you have the stats to see this. Um, that said, I know that we have a lot of fans in Brazil who ask about regional pricing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about unexpectedly. Um, I would say that I think probably like proportional to it, um, proportional to the you know population base or the you know, what I might expect. I think Foundry does super strongly in uh, Germany. Uh, I think probably like how much Ulysses Spiele has, has done to create great like 
DSA5 content has contributed to that, but I think uh, that probably like Germany's a country where there's maybe like more foundry users and purchasers than I would maybe expect there to be. Um, I think also, um, I think, you know, while it's a little bit smaller, I think like the, the Japanese community really surprises me uh, with foundry being like, you know, used there I, like obviously we rely on you know foreign language localization you know community localization work but um you know i i wouldn't have guessed that a product kind of built and designed for english would you know necessarily play well in in japan and the fact that it is and that people are using it is like just totally cool for me i um you know i think that that kind of global reach is that's pretty awesome. Yep. Um, another one for uh, we, you. And... Go ahead. I was just going to say that we also, the the thing that astounds me for population growth is how quickly Brazil has overtaken a large portion of our community. Uh, they've, for the fact that uh, regional pricing isn't available and we don't have a good solution for that. The fact that they're 4% of our Discord server is surprising. Well, another one for Andrew, no and I know that we, you know, feel free to punt this question because it's asking, you know, about financials, but um, Killer Men PL2 is asking, roughly speaking, you know, the how many licenses of Foundry are selling monthly? Less than a hundred, tens of thousands, you know. Again, puntable. Yeah, uh, well, it's, uh, the software's doing really well. I probably will take mostly a punt on that. Uh, it's it's definitely not less than a hundred though. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, we're doing quite well. Uh, we're, we're selling plenty of copies to people, uh, lots of copies every month and more than enough to you know support us doing this and you know keep all of these great folks employed and uh you know make us feel like our time is is well rewarded um but yeah sorry sorry i, I probably won't get into specific numbers but um but yeah no we're, we're doing we're doing quite well and uh, i think the sustained growth of the community is something that is evident um indirectly uh on discord on reddit on twitter um, you know, I, I think you can you can sort of get a sense of some metrics there in terms of like looking at participation in various like Discord subreddits. Uh, I saw someone posting on Twitter the other day with like a comparison of number of tweets about different you know different platforms. Um, Foundry was represented fairly well there. That was interesting. Um, so yeah, you can you can sort of get a sense for how we're growing, um, but I won't speak to exact numbers. One thing that's been interesting to me has been to more and more I can walk up to someone and be like, oh, I work for Foundry. And they're like, wait, the virtual tabletop yeah. or I, they're, they're playing games on it. It's like, yeah. um, or I'll be re, you know, reading tabletop news and they'll mention Foundry. One, cut, one website I saw literally is just like, they're now posting articles when Foundry updates. Like, you know, B9 Stable had an article. I'll reshare it. But um, CVR.com, which is a big site about um, covering like games and comics and movies, posted about how Foundry is like the secret best way to play D and D, and that's really cool. Um, seeing, I wish I knew. Name I wish I knew where people like kept getting the old logo so that I could like <laughs> ban it from the internet. Um, I love that this article showed up, but I just like cringe when I see people continuing to use our old logo. It shows up a lot. It's like lots of Patreon creators like in their in their tiers that have like you can get foundry stuff. They're all using the old logo. I wish yeah. I wish we could get people to upgrade that. I mean we could email these people, but we could, yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, where did you get this logo? That's all I care about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a while back, I saw someone ask about marketplace potential, and someone's also asking about um, do we feel like the one-time purchase is potentially short-term benefit, long-term hindrance? Um, sorry, all these questions are for you, Andrew, but... How boring. 
Uh, How good, bored. Good it turns out people everyday. want to know about you know Foundry's future on yeah. the end of your wrap-up stream. Um, well, I think uh, certainly our our business model is a key key component of what we're doing. Uh, I think it's it's what's allowed Foundry to be as successful as it has because I think it's a customer friendly model that. Uh, is really appealing to people who are looking to, you know, have ownership over their own role-playing experience. So, um, yeah, uh, I think everything that we're doing is ag acknowledging that that's the business model that we use. And we've got plenty of runway in terms of continuing to grow. And, uh, and you know, once we have reached a, a point closer to entitlement in terms of people who want Foundry already owning it. There's lots of things that I think we'll be able to do to um, you know, sustain the business and to offer things that will be interesting to our users and fans. Uh, we're not anywhere near that kind of discussion needing to happen at this point. So for the next couple of years, it's really just gonna be continuing to do exactly what we're doing on focusing on, on making the software better. And you know, it's not anything that will go away because you are self-hosting it. It's not like we have to keep our servers running or anything, you know, it's a self-hosted software. Um, so we'll just keep making the software better and better. And, um, you know, our, our customers will benefit from that and we'll get new customers. And I think hopefully everyone will be happy. Um, but I don't, I don't want that to come across as naive. Like we do have a clear business plan. It's not one that I'm gonna like get into the details of, but um, yeah, you know, we're not naive about about what our business model is and what that means, but things are looking really good. So, uh, we've got plenty of we've got plenty of runway to just keep keep focusing on what we've been doing. You may recall that also, we'll have last March job. Store. That's going to make us, you know, weekly revenue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we will make tens. We will make tens of dollars with the merch store. Tens of dollars. And you may remember that Andrew's last job was doing forecasting, so I think he has a pretty good handle on. <laughs> how to calculate all of this. Yeah. Uh, here's a question oh, about bad. the tasks. Schultz Cole asks, when starting out developing Foundry, what methods, if any, did you use for marketing? How long after you started working on it, Foundry did you start showing it publicly? I think it's I... kind of always been word of mouth, hasn't it? Yeah, it's pretty, it's always been very organic. I mean, I think, um really before creating a a patreon i did sort of post a, a very like teaser video on reddit um and that got some interest enough interest that i thought it was worth you know creating a patreon and then from there it was all just sort of collecting patreon support and growing that community during the early stages of development um, you can still find like some of the very early videos on YouTube. Uh, like we haven't removed them, so um, you know they're they're up there. And uh, yeah, those those updates on YouTube and on Patreon just got people excited. And then relying on word of mouth for people to sort of share, um, you know, with others, and, and that was that was plenty. Um, I'd say how long after I started developing did I start showing it publicly? It, it wasn't that long i mean it was probably like a month and a half of you know early prototyping before i had something that was like oh this is looking pretty cool uh i mean it wasn't very f fully featured or anything back then but um i think the initial youtube video was probably around like october or so of of 2018 and and i think i started noodling around with it in like august so Uh, Moomin asks, where did the name Foundry come from? Uh, good question. Uh, there's a long history there. Um, I, 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 I always wanted to run a... Um, I, I, I was a really big MMO fan. Still am, although I don't have... I don't play them currently because of you know time and life but i i loved mmos growing up and there was a time when i was between games 
Um, and I was very excited about a game being developed by what ultimately was the ill-fated 38 Studios. Um, they were making a game that was codenamed Copernicus. They had this original uh, IP, the world of Amalur. They did release a game, Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, was a, okay. a, 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 C, a, a CRPG that they released in that universe. Uh, but there was an MMO that was under development, and I was pretty excited about what they were doing. Um, it was like kind of intended to be sort of like an EverQuest spiritual successor with bringing in some like more modern, at the time, World of Warcraft cornerstones. Um, and having loved both of those games, I was kind of on board that train, and so I, I created a fan site. And I had to pick a name for the fan site, and I created a fan site that I called Amalur Foundry. And it was supposed to be a fan site for like theory crafting and talking about ideas about the MMO and stuff like that. And then there was quite a disappointing turn of events where the state of Rhode Island and 38 Studios got into quite a heated financial dispute that. Um, well, it didn't go 38 Studios' way, and, and it uh, kind of all folded, and the MMO didn't happen. And um, so, yeah, so that that was a short-lived first foray into development. That was like one of my first sort of software development projects. I, I uh, was pretty young at the time, and I uh, it started out as a WordPress site. And so uh, PHP and WordPress, I see people like probably grimacing in the audience, but um, you know, as so many people probably like, that's the kind of thing that gets you started thinking about like, how do you make computer do thing? Um, and and so, uh, you know, that- is uh, good for that. Yeah, so um, yeah, and, and that, that was kind of one of my first technology projects and the rest is a bit history, I guess. And I just sort of kept the foundry name throughout as an homage to that of several hundred I, hours in kingdoms of amala the reckoning <laughs> it's really good i knew you were doing elder scrolls online stuff before which is why you can find like tamriel foundry um yeah. on uh, like in some old videos i didn't know there was one even older than that yeah it's amusing i um Ben and I started looking at Elder Scrolls Online because I stumbled onto this mod and it's on sale. Um, but the mod creator for the uh, add-on that apparently lets you hide other players thanks you in their README. <laughs> you really? personally. Yeah, that's funny. I was like, well, uh, it might be coded well. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, found Foundry Tactical Combat for Elder Scrolls Online was probably like one of the most downloaded modules for that game. And uh, while I was the one making it, it I was really enjoying that. Um, and then after I sort of stepped away from ESO, uh, others, developers in the community took that and, you know, it still exists as far as I know. And that's pretty cool. I think we're just about at time here. Thanks again, everyone, for joining on. It's always fun to see all the staff in one group. Um, yeah, we see this weekly, but you know, others get don't get a chance to see us often. Um, Nath, do you, look, should we sign off with a message for the community? What's one thing you want to tell everyone going into 2022? Wow, I feel really put on the spot. Um. Going into 2022, I think we can all look forward to more advances, more features. The software is only going to grow from here. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more community growth. We're going to see a lot more, uh, I hope we're going to see a lot more premium content that will really excite people for their own games. And I'm looking forward to doing more of these streams, more just engaging with the community and being, continuing to be part of this really awesome project. Andrew, parting message? You're on mute. Thank you. I'd just like to say uh, thank you so much to the community. Um, your support and uh, 
energy it, it it really is so motivating and like the way that folks talk about foundry vtt and refer their friends to it and you know recommend it uh to others and you know help uh newcomers in the community when someone shows up with the same sorts of questions that you know everyone has when they're new to the software the, the way that everyone is kind of supportive and helpful uh and encouraging with with it is it's something that is really humbling and and motivating for me and for the team i'm sure but um just really really grateful for the community that we have uh, whether it's developers or users, helpers, moderators, wh whatever anyone's role is in the community, just the fact that there's so many people that are involved and engaged with us and with the software, uh, it's I just feel super fortunate. And uh, so thank thanks to everyone who's who's out there in the Foundry community for for everything that you do and for supporting us and for making you know all the things that we did in 2021 possible. And I just can't wait to to keep things going next year roman i don't know what i can say that hasn't already been said this community is fantastic our moderators our helpers the content creators everyone is fantastic and they they make this job just so much fun and uh i'm just looking for uh more of that I'll extend a thank you to all the uh, tireless developers who build amazing things for Foundry, keep me up at night with their crazy ideas and equally crazy problems. Please keep doing what you're doing. Um, I look forward to when we cross 2,000 modules, probably sometime early next year. <laughs> Kim? Yep. Thank you for all the enthusiasm. Uh, it really is very motivating, as Raymond said. But really, we probably should have left on Andrew's message because that was way better. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, too bad. I went to Northern uh, Discord instead of leaving Boss for last. Matt. <laughs> uh, I'll repeat the thanks that everybody else has. I actually, just for fun, checked my old work email to see what I was doing at this time last year, and I was putting together a hacky solution just due to uh, how the system was put together for hiding inactive posts for our writers at the last company that I worked for and uh, doing this is a lot more fun than that and getting to interact with the community for the past uh, nine months now has been really crazy and I just hope that going into the new year as Foundry keeps growing that we can keep the tight-knit kind and helpful community that it started with and that it's managed to maintain so far. Yeah. Secret Fire, sign us off for the year. I, I'm proud to be part of this community, uh, amazing community. And um, the next year will be uh, important for me uh, since it's the uh, beginning of, uh, of my contribution uh, to Astundri uh, VTT. Uh, and it will be. Uh, it will be very important uh, for me, and uh, uh, I uh, I expect. Uh, um, of, I I don't feel my word. Sorry, uh, it's just that um, I I um, I expect for twenty two to be uh, the best for uh, for us. Yeah, and for Thanks. all the users. Uh, Well, everyone, thank you again for joining us all for as we wrap up 2021. We'll see you in 2022, where I hope all of you will have great right rolls on your dice. I think that's a wrap. To Foundry in 2022. Hey. Hey. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah, thank you all for joining. And see you all next year. <laughs> <laughs>